kiwi frog requested that I do brontosaurus. Fortunately, friend of the geek group named Thomas gave me this, well, brontosaurus, on the grounds that uh, I return it to him when it's done. I am more than happy to oblige for a couple of reasons. Most prominently, Brontosaurus is still, even though T-Rex has sort of eclipsed it for Americans, it's still synonymous with the term dinosaur in the popular culture. And it kind of always has been since its discovery. We haven't actually done a sauropod yet on the show, a true sauropod. We did Plateosaurus, but that's kind of weird. Sauropods are sort of the dinosaur. Um, Right when dinosaurs were the dominant creatures on land, that's when sauropods rose to prominence, and they were around until the late Cretaceous. So 120 million years as the, the top vertebrate herbivore on land is nothing to sneeze at. They're also the largest uh, uh, land vertebrates to ever walk the earth. So, Yes, let's, let's talk about these guys. Brontosaurus was found in the Morrison Formation of Wyoming, Colorado area in 1879 by Othniel Charles Marsh. It wasn't found by him, he described it. Uh, ask me about the Bone Wars sometime. We could do a whole episode about that. But Marsh described it as thunder lizard because of the sound that it would make as it walked. We now know this to be inaccurate, but it's still a cool frickin' name. And that's why I still call it Brontosaurus. Its proper name is Apatosaurus, uh, which means deceptive lizard. And because that name has precedence over Brontosaurus, because we later found that Brontosaurus was not a distinct genus, some people still think that it is a distinct genus. Uh, the way Marsh did, but I point out that Marsh was way more interested at the time in naming as many genera as he could in order to win the rivalry uh, than he was in actually making sure that these genera were all distinct. He also named one of the specimens Atlantosaurus, which is also a really cool name, but we can't use that either because it's synonymous with Apatosaurus. All of that said, I still like calling it Brontosaurus because, as previously mentioned, it's such a cool name. And people know what you mean when you say Brontosaurus. It's like calling all pterosaurs pterodactyls. It's not accurate, but people know what you mean. For the layman, that's enough. Uh, I understand the need for having distinctive binomial nomenclature type names for all creatures. That's how the scientific community operates. but. For the layman and for the dinosaur fans, we, we really should just stop yelling at people for calling it Brontosaurus, guys. I mentioned that it's been a fixture in popular culture pretty much since it was described. Because I'm an animator, I feel like I'm obligated to mention that Windsor McKay, uh, one of the first uh, 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 animators working with hand-drawn animation as opposed to cutouts or, or what have you, made one of the first motion picture animations featuring a brontosaurus called Gertie the Dinosaur. It was a very inaccurate depiction of Gertie the Dinosaur, but it, it, it was ahead of its time in every respect, like, like technically, just not in the depiction of the actual creature. So with all of that ranting out of the way, let's get to why this depiction is inaccurate. It, it's actually really consistent with this painting that was very famous done by Charles Knight for the American Museum of Natural History featuring a brontosaurus. At the time, it was thought that these animals were far too large. It was the size of like three to five elephants. They were too large to live on land, so they must have been semi-aquatic, like when they weren't in the water so that the water could support their bulk, they would barely be able to move on land. They would be these sluggish, tail-dragging, the same narrative of natural history that I've been ragging on this whole series. As of the 1970s, we know that, based on the work of Backer and Coombs and a lot of others, they were not aquatic creatures, they were highly adapted land creatures. Like, like, they were depicted 
at the time, uh, in, the, in the early part of the 20th century, with splayed toes, uh, this sort of classic bell curve posture to the spine, dragging tails, sprawled gait, with, with, with the arms just outstretched like a, like a, a crocodile or a lizard. And, and really not the active elephant-like creatures we now know them to be. I say elephant-like referring to their mode of locomotion and not necessarily to their lifestyle, though that's not terribly inaccurate to say that they lived like elephants, as far as we know. Brontosaurus had a very deep chest, uh, more so than other diplodocids at least, where this guy has uh, in dorsal view, he's, he's about round, he's, he's, a, he's an egg shape for the torso, whereas in life, or for a real one, it, it would have been much deeper than he is wide. And, and in some specimens, it's actually quite rectangular, the, the rib cage at least. But when you give it an accurately proportioned chest, suddenly it has to be digging ditches in the ground in order to support the, uh, the sprawled limb posture that, that people like to give it. Which means that in order to be consistent with the observed specimens, you have to give it an upright, straight posture. And you have to take it out of the swamps. Now, you, you'll frequently see restorations that sort of look like they have uh, an arched spine as opposed to the more straight spine that I'm pushing. Uh, the neural spines on Brontosaurus were really, really high, the, the vertical part of the, the vertebra. And they were highest in the very middle of the back, about halfway between the front limbs and the hind limbs. So it would have had a, a sort of arch to it, but it wasn't because the spine was arched, it was because the spines on the spine were arched. Since we're talking about posture, I will mention that the legs are way too short. If we're going to move them under the creature, we should also lengthen them. Uh, and the feet are portrayed as plantigrade, which is consistent with what they thought at the beginning of the 20th century, but we now know is inaccurate. It also has not the right number of toes. It should have five toes each. The front feet were relatively typical of sauropods. They, they were half moon shaped, if you were to look at a footprint of them. It really did resemble nothing so much as a hoof, but a hoof made of flesh rather than hoof. They had only one claw on the first digit, and it was relatively large and, and stuck out inwards towards the center of the creature, and the rest of the toes didn't have any claws on them at all. They were, they were one bone. So it was this solid pillar thing supporting the, the front limbs of the creature, and I'm, I'm, I can't sit up straight enough to, to put my arm straight, but imagine that my arm is just going straight up into me. Uh, similarly, the hind feet would also be digitigrade, is what we call that. When it's on its digits, it's digitigrade. When it's on its heels, it would be plantigrade, like us. The first three toes on the hind feet had claws, the, the first of which was the largest. They, they angled outwards, and again, these are probably more like an ostrich's hooves than they would be like talons. They, they, they were probably for locomotion, not combat. The hind feet, however, were more like an elephant or a stegosaur or what have you, where they, they were supported by a fleshy pad as well as the toes. The front limbs are proportionally much shorter than the hind limbs, but as previously mentioned, the limbs are way too short. The, the foreleg should be the same length, maybe a little shorter than the femur. The tail is too short. The tail is not as disproportionately long as you might see in other diplodocids, like Diplodocus, where it's like twice the length of the neck. On Apatosaurus, it was maybe a three to two ratio. There's a theory that is amusing, but maybe not terribly accurate, that it would use its incredibly long, incredibly skinny tail. It, 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 its tail was slightly unique in that it, it tapered really abruptly. It had um, what we, I want to call it a concave fall off to its, uh, uh, the width of its tail. But towards the tip, it was so long and, and skinny that it might have used it as a bullwhip. 
and, and there, were, there was a mechanical analysis that it could break the sound barrier with the tip of its tail the way you break it with a, a bullwhip and that would make a, a sound for communication purposes. And as cool as that is, other people have pointed out that that would really hurt the tail <laughs> to be doing that. And it bears repeating, the tail should not be on the ground. It should be relatively straight out and rather muscular, especially at the base. The head is rather terrible. They've, they've sort of tried to be faithful to the profile view, but completely screwed over the dorsal view. Uh, in dorsal view, Diplodocids in general and Apatosaurus specifically had very square skulls. They, they had wide mouths in the front. This is portrayed with basically a beak, whereas not only did it not have the cheeks that you would see in other herbivorous dinosaurs, it, it didn't even have terribly advanced teeth. It, it had pegs at the front of its mouth, and we figure that it used its wide mouth with its many little tiny teeth as a pair of rakes to just pull the foliage off of plants, because it didn't pre-process its food at all. It didn't chew it, it didn't have a gizzard that we know of, it just swallowed it all and let the gut take care of everything. So the head was really just a grabbing device to bring food into the gut, and consequently the head was tiny. It, the animal, as I said, was the size of a few elephants, the head was the size of a horse's head. So this head is far too large. It's, it's not postured terribly badly though. I don't like the eyebrow ridges, but it would definitely have defaulted to having its head at a, at a right angle to the neck. It could move its head down further or up higher if it needed to, but its rest position was not dissimilar to this. I should mention the nostrils. The, the nostrils were where you would expect them, they're at the front of the head, but the naris, the hole in the, the skull that accommodates the air passages, is in between the eyes, it's on top of the head. And for a long time it was hypothesized that that's where the nostrils were. So when we thought that this was an aquatic creature, that made perfect sense, because they're like, oh, that's a snorkel. It can, it can have its entire body submerged and just have its head poking out of the water and, and snorkeling. If you were ever a stupid kid who saw a garden hose and a snorkel and decided, hey, I can swim on the bottom of the pool, you know how well that works, or rather, how terribly that works, and I hope you didn't drown. Don't try that. I'm really lucky. Point is, the snorkel idea is dumb. The current theory is that it was merely a fleshy resonating chamber running from the top of the head to the nostrils at the front of the head. So it was for honking, like so many other cranial structures on dinosaurs. And finally, we get to the neck. I saved this for last because sauropod neck posture, as I mentioned in the Plateosaurus episode, is one of those things that reminds us how young the field of paleontology really is in the grand scheme of things. There have been attempts at rigorous mechanical analyses of the, the morphology of sauropod necks. It's infuriating because they keep going back and forth on it. Is it rigid or is it flexible? Uh, uh, is it rigid in the middle and, and flexible at the ends? Would it have held its head high? Would it have held its head near the ground? Would it have even had the ability to pump blood to its head if it held its head high? These are questions that have been addressed and we've gone around in circles on them. As far as I can tell from the available materials, this posture with its head off the ground in sort of an, an alert, it, it, this toy is kind of worn out because Elizabeth put a hat on it for months and it weighed it down, but it doesn't seem like it's unreasonable for, for a brontosaurus to hold its head high in an alert pose, even though its default pose would be much closer to the horizontal. Diplodocids are kind of unique among the Sauruskians because the, the cervical ribs, which are those long bony struts that seem to support the neck, are surprisingly short in animals with necks this long. 
This has implications for the musculature of the neck. Not entirely clear on what those implications are, however. It might mean that the neck is more flexible because there's less restricting it from bending whichever way it wants to, but it might also mean that the neck is weaker because cervical ribs seem to be ossified tendons, which means that they're used for attaching really strong muscles. The reason I mention all of this is because the neck is the reason, supposedly, that sauropods were able to grow to the size that they were and be so such successful land animals for as long as they were. Having a long, flexible neck with a tiny head that doesn't have to process your food before you swallow it into your massive gut means that you can feed really, really efficiently. It means that you don't have to move your massive body around in order to clear a large area, or according to some studies, a large volume in three dimensions uh, of foliage. And instead of envisioning these sluggish, heavy, swamp-dwelling creatures that can barely lug their own weight around and have to survive on soft water plants, we have these highly efficient, highly specialized land-dwelling herbivores that are large enough that they have no natural predators, mind you, just at the opposite end of that activeness spectrum. And I should add that when researching this episode, I, I came across a tidbit that I wasn't aware of. In 2006, or according to some reports, 2008, I haven't seen as much material on this as maybe I should, uh, in the Morrison Formation, they found trackways from Apatosaurus, from, from little baby Apatosaurus. And they have walking trackways where they're walking on their four legs, just like an adult would, but they have running trackways from baby apatosaurids, apatosaurids, apatosaurs, that were running on their hind limbs with their, with their four limbs just tucked up the way you would expect, you know, a, a, a prosauropod or a platyosaurid or even an ornithischian dinosaur to run. Active. Less like a reptile, more like a giant bird, is the takeaway on this one. I hope that was satisfactory, Thomas and Kiwi Frog. Thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Suggest dinosaurs for me to have on the show. You could even send me a toy dinosaur. Our address is in the description. Go to thegeekgroup.org to find out how you can become a member and donate, and we'll see you next time. This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon. I believe so, yes. <laughs> Whoa! Late Jurassic.